Professor Han, thank you so very much for your time and for joining our interview series. Uh, you are welcome. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let me start with the first question. Uh, how do you define populism in the context of South Korean politics? And what are the key criteria you use to identify populist movements? Well, I offer two criteria for populism. One is high extent of distrust to our political elite, conventional politicians. Another is uh, advocacy of the people as the genuine source of political legitimacy in politics. And I define populism as such by these two criteria overall. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do you think Derrida's concept of ontology is useful to study of populism, not only in Western Europe or Latin America, but also globally? Well, I was very fascinated by Derrida's concept of ontology, because we can say that the spectrum of populism is spreading, haunting the whole world today, as Marx and Engels talked about spectra of uh, communism haunting Europe. So we are now in living in the age of you know, uh, uh, spectra of populism. And the way ontology suggests that this ghost, that the spectra begins by coming back, and why the uh, spectra comes back today? Uh, this is my you know, question. And uh, Derrida observed that this uh, spectrum of uh, uh, communism, whether communism or populism, comes back because it has a, some kind of normative appeal. You know, I would say that in East Asia, we have a, a, about the same kind of uh, analogy. In East Asia, when a, when a person dead, died, and uh, we hope that ghost or soul could take rest in peace. But sometimes this spectra ghost comes out to the world and wonders why we say that these ghosts speak some kind of deep sorrow, some kind of resentment, some kind of anguish. So we say we should do something for this ghost to get relieved from this anguish. And if there's some kind of you know, emotional and uh, normative appeal. And in the same way, Derrida says that the uh, spectra of Marxism or even populism comes back because it has some kind of normative principle that we have to keep. And therefore, Derrida wants to, to defend the kind of cost or spectra which he defends, Marx as a critique, while deconstructing all other types of cost, which represent maybe orthodoxy type or you know, historical materialism, whatever it may be. I like this kind of analogy very much now. All right. In, in your article, The Ontological Approach to Populism, you argue that, and I quote, thus there is no reason for ontological approach to treat populism in itself as an intrinsic danger to democracy. On the contrary, in many historical examples, populist orientations and movements have paved the road to democracy until modern democratic institutions became rooted there. Can you please give concrete examples to clarify the assumption that populism is not intrinsically dangerous to democracy? Well, to begin with, I would say that democracy has a, some kind of a normative principle. That means people as a real source or genuine source of legitimacy and political power and populism involves that kind of appeal here. But the empirical reality sometimes is far from this normative appeal. And therefore, this populism has some reason to appear in the real world. You know, that is the starting point. And Derrida, observe, of course, observes that populism emerges in the world in order to fulfill this normative appeal, the kind of lost future, the future that never arrived but we cannot give up this hope for the future. And what is this hope for the future? In the case of populism, first of all, most important thing is the most, what I mean? No, no, you go ahead, right. Professor, I can hear you. Okay, 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 good, yeah. Well, the most important thing is um, um, 
uh, people should see in as uh, the real sources of uh, the political power, the legitimacy of the political power. So therefore, this provides a good reason for us to pay good attention what aspect of populism really holds a kind of contribution to democracy while uh, providing danger to democracy. And in so far as I can see, in so far as populism provides good example of this primacy of the people, advocacy of the people, it could promote uh, democracy. While if uh, the populism provides more hatred feeling, then it may danger you know, democracy. And we can show good example in the history. Many of the Latin American experiences of the populism during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, a good example, I think, and also in some, uh, you know, South, uh, Southern Europe, and also in Korea, in the case of 1980, this provides a good, excellent example of a populism which provides very good stimulus to furthering democracy. All right. Uh, what are the basic historical milestones in the formation of significant genealogical traces of populist imagination in modern Korean history? I think the most important thing happened during the 1980s when our country uh, was through uh, the process of uh, popular political democracy. And the main actor was a uh, student, Kyle the student, and also the Protestant church advocate kind of uh, emancipation theology. And they combined together to work out the, the forgotten history of populism uh, the, the key concept was the minjung. Minjung means grassroots people. And the student tried to retrieve the minjung culture in terms of art, dance, folk dancing, you know, performances. And also they initiated the process of democratization by advocating the people which was neglected or suppressed by the military leader dictatorship. And, and so therefore the most important uh, kind of milestone in the case of Korea, I think was happened during the 1980s. And that time the student even uh, moved further to get into every field, you know, go urban, urban scanty town and the rural area, also in factories to become a, a worker, to work with the stu uh, workers to help uh, to organize the, the labor union. And in this process, they really helped to provoke the constructive image of populism in the process of democratization of Korea. Yeah. All right. Uh, you state that Populism in itself involves both pro-democratic and anti-democratic streams. Yet, in the case of South Korea, the historical experience as well as the empirical analysis shows that the pro-democratic streams, exemplified by candlelight vigils, have been so far more stronger than the anti-democratic ones like hatred populism. Can you please elaborate on the pro-democratic streams that helped consolidate democracy in South Korea? Okay, thank you very much, good question. Actually, as foreign observers see the South Korea, Korea represents a very strong case of a political democracy. Although Korea was governed by military regime or authoritarian regime for a long time, but uh, the peaceful change of government by election take place took place in uh, 1988 and uh, you know, for about 40 years, there's a very peaceful way. And we have two strong party, opposition party and uh, uh, a ruling party and a very vibrant political culture, a very strong civil society and the movement too. So in that sense, Korea is not really a populist country in any way, but nonetheless, uh, at the level of a citizen or the actor or uh, civil movement, I see uh, the tendency of you know, kind of uh, uh, populist movement and this candlelight march, candlelight vigil, as well as 
uh, national flag movement took place in uh, 2016 and early 2017, and it shows a very dramatic kind of cases of populist movement. They took place in the same downtown street in Seoul for several months, but they never uh, clashed each other. No stone was thrown to each other. It was a very peaceful coexistence, but nonetheless, they are very different because uh, the national, because the candlelight march was composed by young people, more progressive people, and more liberal ideology, and also very pro-democracy movement, whereas the national flag movement was composed of more old people and more um, uh, conservative people, and uh, they wanted to return to the uh, sort of you know, authoritarianism in a way. So they are competing each other, but nonetheless, as I said, it was a good case that they both compete each other peacefully at the downtown streets, you know. But it turns out that those who support um, uh, candlelight march, they put much emphasis on the primacy of the people, uh, whereas those who supported uh, the national flag movement uh, favored very much uh, the distrust of the politician. And it seems to me that it is a good indication that those uh, populist movement who advocate the people anyway, in the Republican way, in the true sense, they tend to promote democracy, as we can show uh, in the cases of uh, 1920, 19, uh, no, 2016's example of populism in Korea. Does it make sense to you? Yes, yes, indeed. Your research distinguishes between the candle right movement and the national flag movement. Could you explain the differences between these two movements and their respective impacts on democracy in South Korea? Well, as I already said, you know, uh, 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 candlelight march, uh, candlelight march uh, movement has a long history in Korea. And it appeared and appeared as a populism, as Dalila said, it begins by coming back from the history whenever our country is facing a kind of a democratic backsliding. And in the case of uh, in the, uh, uh, two, uh, 2016 cases, our government was controlled. We were controlled by the regime of Park Geun-hye, President Park Geun-hye, who was, uh, who is, uh, the uh, daughter of our former president, military leader Park Jung Hee. And therefore, uh, he was trying to return to bureaucratic authoritarian regime by trying to control civil society by means of uh, bureaucracy, you know, very well organized bureaucracy. But our society has already been very much progressed because we experienced democratic process during the 1980s and the main body or main energy in the civil society became much younger, more energetic, more vibrant, more kind of uh, actively seeking freedom uh, expression and um, a free assembly and all kinds of democratic principles. So therefore, there was a significant gap between what we observe in politics in government and what we observe in the civil society. And this gap becomes increasing and increasing. And finally, it became kind of the clashing of two movements in the downtown of uh, Seoul. And this shows that when our country is facing a kind of threat to democracy in the form of democratic tax, tax you know, sliding, then there appeared a kind of energy in the civil society to push democracy forward in the form of a uh, candlelight march, you know, kind of protest movement. And it was not the first time, but in, nine, in 2016, that protest appeared so decisively impressive and it was so successful. So it was finally decided that parliamentary decided impeachment, a kind of, of, of President Park Geun-hye, which was uh, accepted by uh, constitutional uh, court. And it shows a very progressive, peaceful process by which the people's power can move democracy further by eliminating a threat to, to democracy or the sources of a democratic back, backsliding. You know, this is a good example, I guess. You know, in the whole history of Korea, very impressive history, I guess. Yeah. In in your view, what are the main threats to democracy in South Korea, 
How do these threats relate to populist movements such as the national flag movement? Take your pardon once again. In your view, what are the main threats to democracy in South Korea? And how do these threats relate to populist movements such as the national flag movement? Well, national flag movement as such, I would say that it's not a kind of um uh kind of a real threat to democracy because it shows a very genuine voluntary organization by the people who belong to more or less a conservative idea, but who want to defend our country, Korea, as a free country against the threat from the North Korea. So therefore, uh, in the past, of course, this kind of movement was organized by the government or the, by conservative wing. But this national flag movement in 2016 was more or less voluntarily and uh, therefore, it showed also a good progress of democracy in you know, one way. But nonetheless, the way in which it suggested, it tried to advocate their voices was not in pro-democracy, but it was mainly against the threat from the North Korea. And they tried to defend free democracy against the threat from the North Korea. That is the main point, you know. So therefore, they, they, uh, they showed a lot of hatred of the political elite, particularly the ruling elite at that time, you know, who tried to um, uh, come closer to North Korean line. You know. Therefore, in my view, insofar as the populism showed kind of a hatred feeling mainly, rather than the people's primacy principle, that it could hinder uh, kind of the progress of democracy. And I would consider this uh, national flag movement is as a one case which belong to this trend, you know. All right. Uh, what were the findings of your empirical research regarding the association between populist movements in South Korea and support for democracy? How do these findings inform our understanding of relationship between populism and democracy in the country? You argue in the case of South Korea, the potential threat to democracy does not come from populist citizens, but from neoliberal citizens. Can you explain why this is the case? Well, this is the question which is rather difficult to explain in a very uh, simple and uh, intelligent way. I was wondering very much. My research was done in 2018, and this empirical research and the real question is, which citizen really support the autocratic strong leader? You know, that is the empirical question. And it turns out that those, those uh, citizens which we can define uh, as a populist in terms of a certain criteria of the questions, and they do not support actually strong auto, auto, uh, autocratic leader at all. But the liberal, uh, neoliberal citizens, they support this kind of strong leadership. And I wondered why. It is rather difficult to answer. But nonetheless, these lib uh, neoliberal citizens are satisfied, more or less satisfied, with the reality of a political liberty as well as economic uh, million, uh, um, uh, market system. So they are more or less privileged, more satisfactory people. But nevertheless, they strongly support uh, autocratic leader because, it is my interpretation, they were threatened by the strong power of civil society, strong civil movement. And they think that this strong movement may hinder democracy. They want you to get rid of this danger, get rid of this threat from the civil society. And in order to get rid of this threat from civil society, they would say, we need a strong leader. That is why they support a strong leader. Although they are very satisfactory relatively uh, compared with other uh, groups, in, in, in South Korea, so they are in a privileged position, but they supported you know, a strong autocratic leader. So that is kind of mystery in Korea, but that is what we found. Right. Uh, Professor Hong, what is your response to the arguments that South Korea is democratically backsliding and in the middle of a democratic depression? Well, as I explained, Whenever we experience the moment of a democratic backsliding, uh, we observe some kind of spontaneous movement in society. 
uh, which strove against it and eventually successful in getting out and get, uh, you know, get, uh, 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 cut, removing that kind of, you know, uh, threats. So, so far, I don't think we are facing a democratic backsliding, but nevertheless, uh, now, the currently, we may face this moment of democratic sliding because uh, both the ruling and uh, opposition party, particularly the leaders and the party itself, heavily relied on the populist image of a uh, kind of uh, uh, hatred feeling, you know, against each other. This is what happened uh, during uh, the recent uh, national uh, uh, national uh, election uh, conducted in April this year, and it is the first time that not the citizen but the political leaders. Uh, move further to advocate the populist idea, populist emotion very strongly, accusing the counterpart, not as my political counterpart, but nevertheless as a kind of enemy to get rid of, to get in prison, you know, something like that. So therefore, the emotional struggle becomes so harsh, unlimited kind of uh, confrontation took place during the election, and therefore, that may provide a good kind of uh, uh, kind of backsliding moment uh, in the future, I think. But so far, uh, I don't think uh, South Korea has experienced many difficulties in back democratic backsliding so far. All right. How will the elections? Uh, how have the elections held last month? influence the political landscape in terms of right-wing and left-wing populism. What implications do you see for South Korean politics in terms of polarization and demonization observed between the ruling conservative party and the progressive opposition party? Well, I don't buy the concept of left-wing populism or right-wing populism. You know, Many people are talking about this term. But in the case of South Korea, I feel that neither left nor left populism is very much significant in my view. Uh, populism as a whole becomes more emotional than either left or right ideological kind of you know, position. And in, in so far as emotion is concerned, the hatred feeling is the most dangerous thing as far as, far as I can observe. And the last general election showed kind of a uh, flourishing kind of emotional uh, kind of energy of hatred, you know, uh, during this election. And particularly what we observe is the emergence of a particular populist leader who occupy a very significant strategic position in political party. His name is Cho Gu, uh, the former professor of law at our national university served as one of the aides to uh, Moon Jae-in president, former president, uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in uh, political affairs. He was very influential this day, and he showed a great kind of energy to accuse the counterpart as an enemy to get, to get you know, uh, uh, punished anyway. And uh, therefore, this emergence of uh, populist leader occupying a strategic position in Korea signify maybe a emerging kind of threat to democracy in the future of Korea. That's the kind of interesting point of observation. I cannot make final decision, but I show, I continue to show very, uh, very uh, significant attention to the role of this politician, this politician Shogu, uh, who was, of course, who has been my friend. But nonetheless, uh, he became very popular populist politician today, a symbol of populism in Korea. And that is a significant difference in Korea today. We don't, we didn't have that kind of figure so far. But through this election, we are seeing the emergence of a very strong populist leader in Korea that makes the present different from the past. All right. Uh, lastly, Professor, uh, does the surge in populist moments in Europe and the USA have any impact on South Korean populism? 
Well, in terms of genealogy of Korea, well, I don't see many influences either from Europe or from the United States. But uh, in the history of populism in Korea, as, you, as we know, the, uh, this uh, kind of negative frame of populism in terms of hatred feeling emerged very strongly during uh, the Korean War and onward afterward, you know. Korean War took place in uh, you know, uh, 1950 to 1953, and after that, anti-red populism uh, shot over all country for some period of time, and it is uh, still very effective. You know? This kind of image, anti-red kind of feeling, or stigma, or labeling, uh, this kind of uh, strategy, political strategy, is still effective in Korea, and this has uh, something to do with the American policy, the American Cold War policies in the past. But today, we are over that stage, but nonetheless, we are not free from our past legacy. In that sense, this genealogical traces of populism is getting back and getting bad and get back and appear and disappear. And in this sense, we can see uh, the continuing traces of a populism, genealogical traces in populism, but I don't feel that these traces have deeply influenced or associated with any traces in uh, Europe or uh, in America. I mean, left or right is a kind of, kind of word that kind of uh, ideal kind of uh, kind of uh, naming, only naming, it doesn't say anything in terms of the policy, in terms of the political orientation. All things today, particularly in the age of SNS, you know, the old thing, particularly populism, becomes more or less mochi, more or less image-like phenomena, uh, extremely kind of emotionally divided society, it is neither either discourse nor a policy, but just kind of image production. And all politicians, all extra institutional forces are trying to make use of this image, reproduce this image by using digital media in a very effective way, because Korea is very advanced in uh, this digital technology. But anyway, I don't know whether it's a good answer to you, but Korea follows its own track, you know. And the foreign observer always apply this left populism, right populism. I, mean, I understand it, but when we try to apply this kind of dichotomy to Korea, I don't feel that it's really fitting to what's going on in Korea. Yeah. Professor Han, thank you so very much. I appreciate your time. Yeah, you're welcome. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Thank, Hope thank you enjoyed you. it. Yeah.